anybody who says they cannot do this in America, they're going to be in for a world of hurt outside of America. Okay, yeah. that's all I'm going to say. If you cannot do this in America, okay, I'm just going to tell you the world outside is going to kick your ass. That's there is no polite <laughs> way of saying this thing. Basically. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is Omar Khan. I'm pretty excited to talk to Omar. I actually met him through Instagram. We were chatting a little bit, sharing some stuff on each other's stories. Pretty excited to have this conversation today. Omar's doing some really big things. So, hey, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. And thanks for having me. What's going on? Let's yeah. get into it. Absolutely. Hey, so first question I want to ask you is the same question I ask everybody that comes on the show. And we want to know a little bit about you and more about your story. So if you could share that with us, how did you get started? Where are you now? And how did you get there? So look, my story is uh, somewhat similar to a lot of folks like my family, three, four generations now, everybody's been running businesses, various types, right? So it's if you grow up in an entrepreneurial environment, you get to see all the highs and the lows. There's lots of positives, but contrary to all the hustle porn that we see online, there's lots of negatives as well. You're basically on your own. You make it, but nobody hears about like just failures. Everybody just hears about the successes. So I'm uh, trying to understand that. But the good things that I took from that experience is understanding that there's all these good and bad times and to prepare for those good and bad times just generally. Right. And my family is fairly financially sophisticated, but they were very upfront when we were growing up as children about, Hey, what can we afford? What can we not afford? Uh, like, how does, how do we afford things? How do we not afford things? Hey, you're lucky here. You're not lucky there. I didn't say you're not lucky there, but Hey, you're lucky to have these things. Look, we traveled extensively as a family as well. It, a lot of things you learn just by observing in your environment. You learn through the process of osmosis. So <clears throat> that was a very good loving parents. That always helps loving educated parents. And then when I went to college, I went, I did typical things like a lot of finance guys do, did accounting and finance, got out of college, got my first jobs in finance, institutionally worked at investment banks, all that sort of stuff, got my CFA, kind of the usual path. But in between, I knew that, for instance, just given maybe my background, maybe my personality type also on top of that, that I always wanted to do something on my own, hopefully, but I just never really pulled the trigger for the first eight, 10 years because I was just in that whole career mode thing. And then when I moved from Canada to the US, gosh, what, six, seven years ago, by that time, I, was, I got married, girl that I was dating, then I got married. We were deciding, hey, does she come up to Canada or I moved down to the US, moved down to the US. But by that time, I had been running and structuring deals and doing all of that great experiences, professional experiences, but also I developed my personal network. So around that time, I realized, okay, I'm in the US, this is really it. This is the place to be. If you want to run any sort of business, you got no excuse now, you've got great experiences, let's go. Just start going, just started putting one foot after the other. And of course, there's a few things along the way and we can talk about them, but that's it. But to be honest with you, a lot of the success is not due to me. It's due to the fact that I had loving parents, good surroundings growing up very supportive. And also the fact that now that I live in the US, so I could have done all of these same things, say in say Canada, where I was living, I might not have had the same success because the market is very different, right? Doesn't mean Canada's bad. I love Canada. I love Canada, but it's just that the market here, the market is bigger. People are more entrepreneurial. So a lot of things you do have, a, if you're successful, have a multiplicative effect. Whereas in a smaller market, you could maybe work twice as much, but there's just not enough to go around. If you think about it, that's basically what it led to what I do today. And I basically run a private equity firm. We buy a lot of real estate. We've got about $250, $300 million in real estate right now. 
I also own a couple of other businesses I'm either shareholders in or we buy out. So the process basically has always been, hey, how do we make the most amount of money for our partners, for ourselves? And how do we do it in a repeatable, sustainable manner, right? Because it's no use being great one year and then the next year you just flame out. Yeah, absolutely. What a background, Omar. That's fantastic. And it's very telling when you're talking about where it stems from, yeah. how you had that upbringing, that, that background with a loving family and traveling together and just that whole togetherness. And of course, having what the last three generations you said of all business owners and running things and running businesses. So you've, you already came with this background. So you said you were, what was it for, you were in career mode for like your first eight years, right? After you finished up I mean, school and everything. Uh, Look, Mike, I might have been in career mode. I might also have been in a mode of, hey, I'm just going to defer this thing. It's pushing it to the right a bit. So, you understand? So it, it, maybe it's a bit of both things. You can't really yep. say. That's what I want to say. Now, I was also lucky that the jobs that I got and the people and the learning experiences I had throughout the time, they were all, all not all, most, not all, most were meaningful experiences. So I actually ended up taking something from those experiences and then was able to implement those in my business career. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Not really career mode, but you were deferring things and you, you had that entrepreneurial bug was always there, right? Yeah. And then you met your wife and moved down to the States uh, six years ago. So you already had all of this stuff established and in place. Like you already knew how to run a business. You already knew all these things. And now you were in the spot where you're like, okay, this is it. I'm going to make it happen. And you did, right? So you're a uh, private equity firm right now, you said you have over 250 million in real estate assets, but you also buy businesses as well, right? So can we talk about that a little bit? Because no, I bring a lot go. of people on, I bring a lot of people on and we talk about a, a lot, most people that come on this show are real estate investors. And I've talked to other people that do other <laughs> things, other businesses and everything, but I'm interested to know, you know, with the firm that you run, how you guys are purchasing businesses and what's the difference between looking at real estate assets that you're going to purchase versus looking at a business asset that you want to purchase. What are some of the differences that you normally see between the two? First of all, purchasing businesses is a lot more complex because number one, with real estate, it's easy to get loans and financing. It's way easier to get loans and financing, right? So this is why you see a proliferation of real estate people. Everybody can be a real estate person, right? Number one. Number two, the level of due diligence is a lot more. And a lot of times the due diligence isn't just like financial or say legal. A lot of this is actually taking a deep dive into qualitative aspects. Hey, is the team good or the customer relationships good, all of that. So this is why on that side, the businesses that I've acquired, one is a, I'm a shareholder in our fitness equipment company. We're launching a restaurant company, not, not doesn't own any of the real estate, just the operation. It has taken much longer to do those things than say, I could, I, as an example, I have done much bigger real estate deals in a much shorter period of time. But the thing is with most businesses, as you'll see is, I know everybody likes to say real estate, I'm in real estate. I can tell you this, the top 10, 20, 30 richest people in the world, they did not make their money in real estate. They made their money running some business because look, the good and bad part about real estate is that you're operating again within reason, right? You're operating within a narrow brand. So it's not suddenly you're gonna go 100X, but the probability of you losing or going to zero is also very limited. So you're operating in this band and it's a great business. Don't get me wrong, but your upside is capped. Whereas see, if you hear about a tech business or all these other entrepreneurs we hear, you hear about the story, guy started off at $5,000 in his garage worth $20 billion. Okay. That stuff doesn't happen with the real estate people. So the scalability part is while it's very hard to get in, but it's like any other, it's like anything in life, right? The harder it is to get in, the more upside you have once you're there. More risk though, investing yeah, in a business versus risk. investing yeah. in real estate. But exactly. And think of one other thing though, just on yeah. that point though, the reason why it's also harder is as an example is because you don't get loans, right? Why don't you get loans? Because lenders, especially banks, they're, they just don't want to take any chances. It's just harder and harder. But when you get on the other side and things start working, man, it's game over. Yeah, that, that's fair. That's fair. The thing I'm curious about when you're talking about looking at some of these businesses right now, you said you're, you're doing stuff with fitness, right? Fitness and restaurants. Yeah, all of these now, businesses are sub like $2 million EBITDA. So the valuation might be say seven to $10 million. So are you targeting like established businesses or yeah. startups? These are established businesses, but they're not like $40 million businesses. You realize right. they're like three to $10 million businesses. Yep. So just right. small businesses that are, yeah, and you're just pumping them up. Yeah. And then okay. awesome. so I've done two of those. There's a fitness equipment company with my buddy in Toronto. Hopefully we can liquidate that and make a good return on our money. But again, those are things also I do to keep myself, to keep your brain power running, right? Because a lot yep. of times you meet people, people doing other things in other industries and that teaches you a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. 
because if you're just doing the same thing over and over again, it gets very competitive, uh, like repetitive. But at the oh. same time, that's also where complacency could set in. And yeah. once one of the things we say in the military is complacency kills, right? So yes. you can only imagine if you're just doing the same thing over and over again. I, I think it's really good that you throw something else in there and that you're looking at small businesses as well. So that that's a little different than other people that I've had on here talking about what they invest in. But you do it with a private equity firm. So you've got investors that are coming in and they're all part of this and helping fund as yeah. you go into these businesses. So with that in mind, what kind of like information are you like, are you putting out to your investors? Like when you go from a real estate deal to a business, like when you say, Hey, this is the next acquisition we want to get. Here's what we're looking at. Like what's the difference between looking at the small business that you want to acquire versus the real estate that you want to acquire? Like when it comes to like numbers, when it comes to what the capital are needed for, needed for it is, what the, what kind of income is the business making? Are those kind of like the things that you guys are talking about? No, the return structure is roughly the same because look okay. at the end of the day, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I don't know about other people. I'm not trying to solve world hunger or world peace. Okay. Only reason why I do real estate or any of these other investing activities is to make money. Okay. Let's just be clear. There is no, everybody loves to talk about their big why. And I know everybody wants to work each other's hand and sing Kumbaya. I'm just not that type of a guy, man. I just, I lay, I was lucky. I'm very privileged that growing up, I led a comfortable life, nothing to do with myself. Sheer dumb luck of being born in the right house. I just like to continue the good times, hopefully just by working hard to ensure that I can. So for me, the returns are the same. And the whole, say, if you talk about how to talk to investors about it, the whole conversations with investors have always been the same. Hey, look, all you're trying to do is make money in a repeatable process with a reliable person, right? Well, that's all we're trying to do, right? It doesn't matter what the vehicle is. Brutal yeah. honesty here, people. Yeah, the why do you care, honesty. man? Money's money. A dollar you get from a business is the same as a dollar you get from real estate. What's yeah, the difference? Yeah, absolutely. As long as you can get it sustainably, repeatedly, with the right people, trustworthy people over a period of time. So once you establish that trust, once you establish that track record, all of these, what is this, oppositions or objections you hear about, they go away. They don't exist. But you have to get to that level. You start off saying, oh, real estate is the only business in the world you should invest in. And then three months later, another opportunity shows up. You're like, oh, this is the best investment. <laughs> you can't really say that because then you lose credibility. Sure. So real estate is probably the most comfortable thing to be in, right? Because like you oh, said, yeah. you have that window and it's very hard to go to zero, like you were saying, but where as a business can flop and it's done, oh, like somebody that. that's running the business can make a bad decision and the business is done. That's one of the crazy <laughs> things about, it's one of the things we talk about too, like when you're investing in individual stocks and all of a sudden there's a scandal and a CEO does something crazy or you have an Enron situation and yeah. things like that, that can always happen. Where in real estate, it's a matter of, hey, you got to pay attention to the market where the market's going in a just accordingly. Sometimes with these businesses, you can't tell, right? You can't tell. Uh, and see, but, and that's where say the excitement is, but that's where the opportunity is also, right? Yeah. That's why if you time it, you're lucky, whatever adjectives you want to use, you can 10 X, you can hundred X, you can 200 X your money. And that's where great fortunes are made. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. And I love the brutal honesty. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> okay. So I think one of the other things I was looking for too, is like when you're looking at some of these businesses that you want to acquire and you said it's more than just the number, are you looking like into the backgrounds of the people that run oh, it yeah, and of course. like look, how long they've been established or anything yeah. like that? Yeah. Not just that, because number one, look, even in real estate, by the way, if you have a scammy operator or somebody who doesn't have a good uh, say reputation, they could be doing a lot of shady stuff that you don't know. And it's really hard for you only find out much later. You only find out when the asset sells and you're not getting exactly, you put right? into it back. So the quality of the person is always number one. And again, you gotta understand, Mike, a lot of people somehow expect that there's a 16 point checklist to everything. Right? I just put it in my Excel and this is coming from a finance guy. I'll just put it in my Excel model. And a number, if it's green, it's great. And if it's, I don't know, red, it's bad. And most of life doesn't work like that. A lot of the interactions we have, the decisions we take are based on a trust-based mechanism. Hey, Trust, but verify, but I still got to trust you starting out. Otherwise, we can't even have a conversation. So it's looking into these things, having multiple conversations with people, then understanding simple things like guys telling you, hey, I've got these great customers, okay? And they've been with me for five years. Great, that's his opinion, right? You have to go talk to the customers. You'd be like, okay, are you going to stick with this guy or stick with this company? Why do you want to stick with this company? Or you go talk to the customers, they could say, hey, yeah, we just met this guy yesterday. Or... Yeah, I have a relationship with, say, Mike. I don't really give a shit about the business. Then if Mike goes away in whatever, one or two years after his earn out, then that customer goes away. Then what do you do? How do you get that cash flow? So a lot of these are qualitative aspects, right? As opposed to, say, a quantitative, 
like you put a number in a box and Excel spits out. Yeah. So that, that is one of the bigger differences I too. Cause even in the real estate side, if you're going on a deal with somebody and then one of the partners walks out and leaves, it's not like you're just going to jump out because somebody left, right? Where if you're tied to a certain business and you're only involved in that business because you're specifically like that person, you know what they're doing and then they leave the business and you're just not sure how the business is going to run without them, where the real estate's going to stay pretty steady because everything's yeah. already put in place. So that's a very good point. That's a very good point. All right. Awesome. Now, during your intro, when you were talking about your background, and everything, you said there was multiple things that you, uh, you could talk about as you got to where you are today, right? So as you started building your businesses. So I'm a little curious about that. Like when you made that shift to yeah. go from being in work mode to entrepreneur mode and you were moving to the States, what was it before or after you came to the States that you said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start my own after. business. After. Yeah. Okay. So you got here and said, okay, I'm going to do it. First of all, I was never opposed to the idea of doing it. Right. I just started, like, oh, the bug was always there. Like we you, talked you about understand a lot of, uh, you understand it. A lot of times you do things and you were like, I should have just done this like ages ago. Yeah. Yep. It was that sort of thing. It wasn't like I was opposed to the concept. It was just, you just kept kicking the can down the road. I would say probably every, everybody that's a real estate investor or a business owner will say the same thing. I wish I would have started this years ago. Probably everybody. I even knew a guy, I actually had him on my podcast not too long ago. He was 26 years old and he's, oh, I wish I started when I was 23. So it's, oh, there's man. always that, oh, I wish I started younger. But that's the whole point of doing something like this and having a podcast like this is getting this out there. It's great that my audience, I have a lot of people my age listening to it and some older people, but I also have a lot of younger people. I have, I have my, my metrics show that I have a lot of 18 to 24 year olds that listen to my podcast, which is phenomenal because those are the people I want to target because I want them to hear stuff like this so that they know, hey, I can do this and I can do this now and I can start now. So by the time I'm Mike's age, I'll be way more wealthier than he is. You know what I'm saying? That's cool. But anyway, now back to you, right? So you come to the States and you said, okay, I'm going to do this. Now, when you first came here, did you come here like following a job? Did you have a, did you have something lined up already? And then you decided to, or did you just come here and say, okay, I'm going to figure no, it out? I, I had, when I came here, I found a job. So it okay. wasn't that hard. I was in corporate development for a healthcare company. But by that time, I had already mentally decided. Yeah. You already was, mentally it, checked out. No, it wasn't, I wasn't checked out. I don't know. I was in the top performers of my, within my group. I was the top performer. You could still be a top performer and mentally check out. Oh, that's true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you could be surrounded by idiots and that's even better because you look <laughs> good by default. <laughs> you look good by default. That wouldn't happen, but yeah, that's a good point. I should think about that. No, I had just decided it's like a switch, right? When that switch flips, it just flips. And you could still be doing, say, whatever you are doing, but when that switch flips, when that realization just happens, it just happens. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's exactly what happens. And, and we've talked about it several times. It's that mentality thing, right? It's yeah. your mentality. It is like a flip of a switch, right? Where you just completely shift what you want to do, shift your mindset and shift what you want to do. That's awesome. Now, when you flip that switch. Yeah. So you came here and you were in that corporate job. You flipped that switch and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start my own business. Tell me like what the steps were from there. Like when well, you went from leaving. I, I, I've got such a simple step. You're not going to believe it. My wife's a physician. I'm doing very well. Okay. We're 30, 31. I don't know what age we were exactly. We're doing reasonably well in our careers. Okay. Yeah. Nobody's like a Mark Zuckerberg. We're definitely not poor by any stretch of the imagination. And being financially fair, reasonably financially sophisticated. I also understand how taxes work, blah, blah, blah. And then I look at my gross and then I look at my net. And I'm like, wow, gross wise, it seems like we make a lot of money. Net wise, we suck. Okay. There's a big gap between gross and net. How do I basically make my, like close that gap as much as possible? Number one. Number two, even if I can close that gap as much as possible, if I keep working, a corporate job, my incremental gains every year, like incremental like increase in like income, as an example, I can never take quantum leaps, right? I can never be like, because for instance, no employer in the world is going to give you a 50% raise year on year for the rest of your life. It's just not going to happen, man. Okay. I don't care who your employer, I don't give a shit if you work for Google, it's not going to happen. Okay. That's just the way it is. Because after a certain while, you are going to be making incremental gains in your income. So you have to change whatever you do to start getting quantum leaps. So it was a taxes part and this whole, even if I crush, it's not like I make a lot more money, right? Yeah, sure. I'll get three, four, 5% more. Great. 
yeah, what am I going to do with three, four, five percent? It's not yeah. like I was making that much money. It wasn't like I was making a billion dollars. So I make three percent more and it's 30 million more dollars. And I don't know, I go buy like the biggest house in Dallas, right? Obviously, I wasn't doing that. So I realized one was taxes. One was, hey, even if I crush it, it's not like I can double my income overnight. So why even bother? Yeah. So I, I think that's something that not too many people really talk about enough is a lot of people say, okay, your problem is income. You need to go find a way to increase your income. And a lot of people think that means that they need a higher paying job instead of finding ways to get passive income. But just because you go get a higher paying job and you bec become a high income earner, a white collar, you're still going to be paying a lot of taxes. And I don't Dude, think a lot of people- I, I did an objection out and I said, okay, even yeah. if I make 200 grand more like in the next five years, percentage wise, I'm just going to go up a slab. Whatever, because I was in the second highest lab, I'll go into the highest lab of taxes. Shit, I haven't solved my problem. Because I'm still having $20,000 plus a month going in taxes. $20,000 yeah. a month going to my bottom line? Man, I can cause a lot of damage. <laughs> $20,000 going to my bottom line. A month. Absolutely. So, haven't really solved the problem. All right, Omar. So, you obviously, you've solved that problem now. So, what did you do uh, to I solve that problem? I haven't solved that problem. I still like uh, to make a lot more money. I, I still like to make a lot more money. Of course. But you've definitely been able to solve large portion of that. Yeah. I have a gut feeling it's through real estate, but how did you secure those that secure that tax haven? So the tax haven primarily is because I run my own company. I've got all these real estate investments that I'm, I manage and run. So all the depreciation, no, no, nothing fancy you haven't heard about. I'm a real estate professional. All the depreciation write-offs we get, of which I get a mountain every year because I keep doing deals, right? And all of our deals make money. We make a lot of money for our investors because of those tax write-offs. And I'm a real estate professional. I'm able to offset my global income. Global means like wife's income and any other investments I have. That's how I've been able to so far solve that problem. Yeah, that's awesome. So nothing that's nothing awesome. groundbreaking that you haven't heard about before. No, definitely not. But I, there's a key thing there that you said that you're a real estate professional. A lot of people that, you know, one of the things that you got to realize if you're, if you're working in real estate full time as an investor, like this is one of those things you need to get that designation. You need to get that real estate professional designation. So you can start claiming a lot more depreciation for, like you said, your global income, not just what's coming in from the real estate asset, but even more than that. So I think that's, uh, that's super important and a, a key thing I want to point out. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Busy. So this I is, think I did okay there. Did I? Yeah. Yeah. I think you did all right. I think you did just fine. No, Omar, this has been fantastic, man. And it's great to see that you came from a pretty good place, right? You were, you always lived a comfortable life. Like you had everything set in a good way, but you still said, Hey, I want to be able to do this and keep going for myself and now build something for your family, right? You're building generational wealth to keep going and keep this going, which I think is what a lot of people want to do. And but you can even do this from you know, the point of being broke, as he said earlier too. Like, Dude, I mean, look at honestly, what Mark if Zuckerberg you can't do did, it in right? America, if you can't do it in America, <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest with you, man. You are going to be in, anybody who says they cannot do this in America, they're going to be in for a world of hurt outside of America. Okay. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. If you cannot do this in America, okay. I'm just going to tell you the world outside is going to kick your ass. That's, there is no politer <laughs> way of saying this thing. Basically. Yeah. All right. Fair point and noted and taken. All right, guys. So this has been absolutely awesome. Omar, I want to transition into something now that I call the final round. I want to ask you four kind of hard hitting questions. One's one's opinionated, but I think it, it adds a genuine value to everybody that's listening. So if you're ready to go, we'll get that started. Right, All right. Hey, so first question is what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Oh, I think the mistake I think is not is thinking like a lot of white collar uh, professionals think that just because I know how to do my job technically, therefore it has some value. And just because, look, you're really good at, say, the technical aspect. Maybe you're an engineer. Maybe you're a finance guy. Maybe you build models really well. That there are diminishing returns to that. Because eventually, after a little while, you're just an operator. So what I had to do was, and I'm doing this because it's not natural to me, is learn how to become better at marketing, how to become better at outreach, how to become better, maybe be even more empathetic, genuinely, not just, hey, screw off. So that's the part which is a weakness, which I'm working on. So I don't know if that's a big mistake, but it's a realization I feel I should have had. No, that's great. And it's humbling that you can point out where you have a weakness and something that yeah. you want to get better at. So that is yeah. definitely huge. 
Okay. Awesome. So next question is what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? And I would say when you first, like when you first came to the U S and decided to start your own business. Marketing, so what, marketing. because look yeah. again, but the flip side to this is if you're all marketing and no substance, that is, you are going to get sued very quickly. Okay. But understanding that the world is filled with say technical operational people, but the world is not filled with enough people who have the vision to look beyond their jaws, beyond their careers, see the bigger picture. And it's very hard to do that. And part of this is networking and understanding how to develop relationships. Part of this is focusing on soft skills and part of this is on marketing. Okay. Fantastic. Very fair point. Now, for those that are listening, this is the third question that are looking to just get started. So do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started today? Look, it depends on your background, right? So for instance, if you have a hard technical financial background, like I did, maybe you need to focus on marketing, right? And by focus doesn't mean you go learn everything. Maybe you partner with somebody who's really good at marketing, but maybe you're really good at marketing promotions, all that stuff, but you don't have the hard skill. Maybe you partner with somebody who has a hard skill. So that part, and it's not easy to do because in, in all partnerships, there's always that one person who's doing more than the other work. So it's hard to do that. The more higher you go, you have to keep changing partners to get to a higher level. But yeah, that's what I would recommend. So it's a lot about knowing what your strengths are and only playing to your strengths, not your weaknesses. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you're, if you're in a relationship like that and you see what the other person's doing, that might be a, a trait that you learn and get better at yourself. So when you move on to your next partner, as you're moving up, that is now something that's not a skill set that you're looking for anymore. Cause it's yeah, something exactly. that you've acquired yourself. So that's awesome. Okay. And the final question of the final round is, do you have a favorite business investing or real estate related book or podcast or both? Well, podcast is obviously yours. Number one, obviously number one podcast in the world. Favorite book. No, I just read extensively. So I'm going to read this book. I'm reading this book called Rise. It's not a business book. It's Rise of the Data Cloud. I don't know. Can you see it? It's by, it's the Frank Slootman is like the CEO of Snowflake. It's a data company. But I just read extensively. There's that, I don't know, have you read that book, Theme of Rivals? It's on Abraham Lincoln. Doris Kearns has written it. I'm going to read that after this. I don't think, for instance, I think there's a very big focus these days on reading self-help books and business books. I think one just has to get into the habit of reading, reading as a means not to solve a specific problem, reading as a means to become a better person, just understand stuff. So I think once you get into that habit, this thing's actually that's benefited me. I'm a voracious reader and it's honestly opened way more doors than any self-help book or going to a seminar or a conference would have ever done for me. Just having that library and knowledge of reading books throughout your life because you understand and learn from people's examples. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's, again, it doesn't have to be a self-help book. Like you're saying, yeah. it's just expanding on your mind, right? Yeah. And just giving you like that mental workout yeah. of reading. So exactly. yeah, it's fantastic. All right. So that is it for the final round, Omar, but I do have one more question for you. So for the people that are listening right now that are like, man, I really like what Omar's talking about. This dude is real. He's not start trying to sugarcoat anything. He's out there just spitting the straight facts. And I want to know more about him. And I'd like to see some more information. So if you could, can you share like where people can find more information about you? You have a website or social media that they could follow. I know you have an awesome Instagram page that I follow. So yes. if you could share with that with us, that'd be fantastic. You can go to our website, boardwalkwealth.com, B-O-A-R-D, walkwealth.com. On the front page, I think it's on the right. There's an email opt-in page, name, email, how'd you find out about us? Click it, you'll get an email. Click the link, verify yourself. You'll be added to the mailing list. And then you can hear my profound thoughts every two weeks. Awesome. Fantastic. Hey, you know where to go find them on that website? Are there links to your social media there as well? Yeah, they should be. Yeah. Awesome. So go follow them there. If not on Instagram, it's boardwalk wealth. It's, it's been awesome following his stuff. That's actually how we met and got connected and, and got him on the show today. So Omar, this has been fantastic, man. And you're a no BS kind of guy, just spitting the facts. And I definitely can say that I appreciate that. And my listeners appreciate that as well. So, Thank you uh, so much. genuinely enjoyed this conversation, man. And I Here. really appreciate you coming on brother. And thank you for your service. I really appreciate it, sir. Hey, Have thank you. One. Thank you. All thank right, man. We're out of here and aloha from Hawaii. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. Mm -hmm.